All right. Good afternoon, everyone. I'm Dr. O'Quarry. I'm one of the full-time clinic attendings. And today we're going to discuss rashes, particularly in the outpatient setting. So I wanted to speak on this important topic that often gets overlooked. I mean, even though it's like usually staring us right in the face. I mean, it's our skin. I mean, it's laid bare for all to see, but for the most part, we avoid it. Now that may be because we're unfamiliar with the rashes and the terminology to describe them, so we just don't delve into it as physicians. Now, during my training as a resident, I was exposed to a lot of skin pathology in my interactions with patients, but I wasn't too comfortable with it as I was relying on prior knowledge of, of identification of things I had learned during med school, particularly in my PEDS rotation. So it wasn't until I was studying for boards that I was I thought I was like really enhancing and updating my knowledge of skin pathology. And this is knowledge I think would have been better served if I had focused on it myself a little bit earlier in my training, because it definitely would have helped me out in my patient interactions. So um, I'd like to pass on some basic and broad info today, broaching topics that I think would be most helpful for trainees, because dermatology is an extremely broad topic, and we could literally be in here for weeks if we really wanted to get into the thick of it. So what is a rash? A rash is a very broad term for a temporary skin eruption, and thus it can encompass any skin lesion. Honestly, one of the leading reasons that people go to the doctor is for chief complaint of rash. And while we have the benefit of being at a large academic center with a myriad of consultants to help us, it's still important for us to have a good fund of knowledge about rashes so that you as a PCP, being the first link in the treatment chain, can officially order the proper labs and imaging needed to expedite a treatment plan or get them to a specialist if warranted. So you have your important questions in your history, 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 history is so important. When did it start? Has it happened before? How long has it been present? Has it progressed? Has it moved anywhere else on the body? You know, social history is really important. Are there, is there anyone else in the house that has similar lesions? Any pain, itching, tenderness, allergies or pets, new behaviors? We often forget about medications. And it can be simple medications like just NSAIDs. You know? So these are important things to ask. Even recent stressors might be a deal. All right, so let's start. How would you all describe this rash? I bet you, you got you thinking that, right? <laughs> As interns, we often just call it that, a blanket statement, and it is not lost on gomerblog.com because they also made fun of us for saying the same thing. So. <laughs> No, but seriously, let's start. So um, we're going to start with primary morphology. By primary, we mean the rash type. And that's the lesion as it first originates before any external changes are applied to it. So that's just how it comes up on the body, where there are papules, which are just you know small lesions, less than one centimeter, nodules, which is basically a, a larger papule. Macules are flat um, on the skin, uh, less than one centimeter. Patches basically larger macules. Pustules have the purulent material in them, vesicles with clear material, bullish is the larger vesicle. Plaques are also flat, but they're kind of elevated. Wheels are well circumscribed, and they come and go plaque-like. And think about it in a wheel, like an actual wheel, a round circle. Um, petechiae, which you know about, they're the pinpoint um, hemorrhagic lesions, prepared as larger amounts of um, petechiae together. Ecchymosis, or think about a large bruise. And telegenctasias, which are the spider-like um, superficial blood vessels. Here's some pictures of that. Um, the primary morphology, the bulla, this really gnarly looking nodule here. Plaques, pustules, crust and fissures and litrification, that's part of secondary morphology, which we'll discuss. And here's some more photos of the primary morphology that we've all seen before. So secondary morphology, this is referring to changes in the primary lesion that's occurring due to natural progression and infection scratching or picking or even healing of the lesion. Um, the chenified I showed you earlier, that's, you'll see that commonly in eczema after they've been scratching a lot, so it gets really thick, um, you know, scales, similar to eczema again as well, or psoriasis, scars, erosions, um, excoriations, we are typically iatrogenic as we're scratching out our lesions. Rash color is also important to describe. 
um, red here, we have erythroderma, um, or a drug rash can be red. Gray, silver, that's typically seen in the psoriatic um, scales. Violet, the heliotrope rash of dermatomyositis. You got hypopigmented, which happens with the tinea versicolor. Hyperpigmented with acanthosis nigricans. Rash textures are also helpful. Hard is described, you know, actinic keratosis is typically described as hard or you rub your hands over it. Soft skin tags, I don't know if ever, who's actually going to go rub on a skin tag. It seems kind of gross, but it's still soft. Um, indurated, you can imagine that with a, a worsening cellulitis that's just so thick on the legs, that's what indurated is like. And verrucous is talking about like wart-like. So rash configuration is talking about the pattern of the rash's distribution. Now angular and annumular, they're similar in that they're both round with erythematous edges, but annular is like flat on the skin and has a total central clearing, while the annumular is a bit more raised off the skin, off the edges, and has some erythematous activity in the middle. Um, it's more like a coin. So pigeonous is like snake. Um, you have your reticular, which is web-like. And her petiform is like vesicular lesions in like a herpetic eruption. So here are some additional descriptors you might want to use when documenting it, um, which can help you to give the provider that's coming after you a better picture of the note. Like, was it just one lesion or multiple? Symmetric versus asymmetric, random or specific, sun exposed versus protected skin, and most importantly, its location on the body. Okay, so now if we had time, I would give us a quick pop quiz on everything that just happened, but we have a lot of material to cover, so I'll just quiz you when you check out to me in clinic, okay? Okay, so I now just want to briefly discuss this since we have a large African American population here in Shreveport, and it's important that their skin pathology is described as accurate as possible, even though their skin pigment may make it challenging. Now, skin rashes on darkly pigmented skin can cause darkling or lightening of the lesion, which can make it harder actually to appreciate the actual pathology. For example, papules may be pale or dark according to the degree of edema or the presence of acanthosis or hyperkeratosis, which can mask the natural the pigmentation. <clears throat> okay, so as we see here, rosacea may be underdiagnosed in patients with darker skin tones because anthema and telegentasias are more difficult to appreciate in darker skin. As seen here on the left, it's a little bit, you know, it just seems dark brown, or it can be extreme, as you see here on the right. Now up here on the left, we see the hypopigmentations that's with some with psoriasis, and then actually benign hyperpigmentation that comes with post-acne scarring. The opposite can also happen, like say you have a hyperpigmented area in a rash that may be mistaken for benign post-inflammatory hyper pigmentation that you see with acne when in fact it's actually active inflammation. So now the typical erythematous and scaly lesions of eczema in dark skin people may appear scaly with grayish or dark brown color as opposed to the erythematous lesions that we often see on lighter skin tones. So this on dark skin people can be confused with scales of psoriasis if a proper history isn't taken. So also in that case the location of lesions is also a clue for your diagnosis. The wheels of urticaria appear skin colored or even a little bit paler because the dermal edema is lightening the skin. And then petechia and papura are difficult to distinguish on darker skin tones. So sometimes you want to use the palms and the soles um, of your hands and feet. That way you can see the petechiae like down here, you can actually see it better here. And there probably is some here, you see a little bit up here, but it's harder to see. And in some cases, as seen here in this pic, depending on where those ashy patches are, the lesion can be confused with psoriasis or even eczema. So again, good history taking is key. Now, we'll get to the rashes I feel that you're gonna encounter most in clinic or ones that I feel like we come across most often here. So for acne, we know there's three different forms, comedono, papular pustular, and nodular. The first thing that a lot of people actually don't know about acne is that you have to have good facial hygiene. So that means you know, washing fa your face 
twice a day with a mild cleanser, using a separate towel for a face and body. Some people don't know that. Um, you want to use tepid water, um, refrain from using multiple harsh products, so you don't want to use a heavy scrub more, like more than once or twice a week, and avoiding strong astringents. Here's um, a little acne treatment algorithm. And like for your run-of-the-mill acne, you know, you can use clear cell or different gel, which is now over the counter, and along with those helpful face washing tips that can help out. So rosacea is a chronic inflammatory skin disorder that often gets mistaken for acne vulgaris. Um, you'll see the persistent flushing um, of the central face and papules. Um, if it's affecting women more than men, usually beginning after age 30. And you can also have ocular involvement, which I did not know. Um, the phimatous subset usually occurs in men, and that's causing skin hypertrophy, which is destroying the facial architecture, most often the nose. Now, patients may report exacerbations being triggered by strong emotions, alcohol, the sun, spicy foods, and that their topical acne medications only make it worse. Um, more frequently, it's diagnosed in lighter skin tones, like I said, because the signs are usually being obscured in darker skinned people. With this, you can try uh, topical tetracyclines, metronidazole, ivermectin. Those might be helpful for rosacea. So folliculitis um, can also look like acne. It's usually caused by gram-positive bacteria, staph, uh, MSSA, MRSA, or gram-negatives like Pseudomonas, and less commonly Klebsiella, Proteus, and Enterobacter. You treat this with topical oral antibiotics, just depending on the severity of the rash. So pitosporum folliculitis is a condition where the yeast, which is actually part of normal skin flora, is getting down to the hair follicles and it's multiplying and it makes it look like acne. Um, if you do a KOH prep, you're going to have the budding yeast and pseudohyphae and they'll also tell you that it's not responding to acne medication. Okay, so folliculitis barbae versus pseudofolliculitis barbae. Um, here it's acute, it's going to be painful, um, and if you get a culture of a pustule, it's going to actually grow something, whereas in the pseudofolliculitis, um, it's chronic, the firm papules, and the cultures are often negative or just normal skin flora. And it's important to note that it tends to af occur in African-American men more often. Tinea barbe has a similar appearance to folliculitis barbe, so again, the history is really important in diagnosis. Um, it's usually occurring in adult men having close contact with animals, which we could have down here because people love farms. Um, and trichophyton is the usual fungal organism causing it. You can get a good di um, diagnosis obtained with KOH prep as well. So on to officially talking about dermatophyte infections. These fungi are subsisting on keratin found in hair, skin, and nails. Now, the five above that are listed are the more common types, but you also have tinea manis, um, facii. We talked about barbae just a second ago. Now, if you have tinea manis, you can also have tinea corporis, um, which is happening in the body. It's due to like auto infection because if it's, if it's in your nails, you're scratching, you can auto infect yourself and get it somewhere else. Now, what's important with this, if you want to avoid treating with steroids if you're unsure of the lesion, because if it's actually fungal, then you risk it turning to tinea incognito. And this is when the fungal infection is exacerbated by the topical steroid, and then it's changing its original morphology. We talked about that earlier. So when that happens, treatment with this is to discontinue the steroid and then treat with the proper antifungal, and it should resolve. It's important to note, though, that nystatin doesn't work for dermatophyte infections. So here's tinea capitis, which is affecting the scalp. You can also get some alopecia with it. <coughs> that should resolve with treatment. Um, tinea corporis. Now, that's basically, since there's so many names for tinea for basically every part of the body, tinea corporis is going to refer to the parts of the body that aren't talked about. So everywhere else except the head, groin, hands, feet. Um, you'll notice that you have the erythematous edges with clearing inside the lesion, and it tends to have scaling on the edges. Patients are going to complain of itching, and it's obtained via skin-to-skin -skin contact or fomites like towels um, and on the floor. Tinea cruris is also known as jock itch. It's more common in men than women. Now you're going to see a sharply demarcated rash with raised borders um, and rarely sometimes vesicles in the inguinal area, in the upper thighs, in the perineum, and the buttocks. Um, 
paralysis is really severe, so it's very easy to get secondary bacterial infection because of this. Uh, it typically spares the scrotum in the males, so this can help you differentiate from Canada into trigo, which often does involve the scrotum, and also the Canada is going to have the satellite papules and pustules, which helps distinguish it from tinea cruris. Now this is an example of how important it is to be sure of your diagnosis because treating with the steroid cream or nystatin if you think it's Canada is going to lead to tinea incognito and improper treatment. Tinea pettis is athlete's foot. It can be interdigital, which is the most common form. I actually saw that in clinic today this morning. You have the moccasin type, hyperkeratotic, and the vesicular bullus, which is only on the medial foot. Um, if you see accompanying ulcerative lesions with interdigital form, you most likely have a secondary bacterial infection going on. Tinea ungium that we know as onychomycosis, the fungal infection of the nails, the toenails specifically, because tinea manis is of the hands. Um, often it may be a source of cutaneous fungal skin infections as well. And here with this, we do, you can use the KOH preparation, but the nail clippings and doing PAS staining of that is a more sensitive test for the fun, than that of fungal culture. Identification, again, is very important of the organism because you could have in your differential traumatic nail injury, onigogrophorosis, which is ram's horn, it's like overgrowth of the nails, which could just happen on its own, or nail psoriasis could also look like this. So pityriasis versicolor is also known as tinea versicolor, but it is not a dermatophyte infection. It's actually caused by malassezia, which is a lipid-dependent fungi. So it gets its name, though, from its versatile color appearance. So it can be hyperpigmented or hypopigmented, as we see here on darker skin, it's hypopigmented, and then you have the hyperpigmented on lighter skin, affecting mainly the upper trunk of adolescents and young adults due to our excess sebum production among this population, and since it's attracted to lipids, that's where the fungus is going. Um, if you have humid tropical weather, that's going to exacerbate this condition, um, but it's not contagious or related to poor hygiene at all. It's usually asymptomatic, but you can have mild pruritus with it. Pruritus rosea is not associated with bacteria or fungal infection either, but it's possibly due to um, HHP7. Um, it affects older children and young adults most often, women more than men. And then we start with our infamous Herald mother patch, about two to five centimeters, tends to be scaly with more crops of smaller lesions appearing about two weeks after, and they can be itchy. Um, it leaves behind this post-inflammatory dispigmented areas, um, and that can last for up to three months, but in darker skin, it can last even longer. Um, with this, though, because of the scaling and stuff that can occur, you might need a um, KOH prep to rule out tinea cruris. So intertrigo alone occurs anywhere that there is opposing skin um, that's constantly touching, like the inguinal folds or under the mammary glands. Um, the persistent rubbing of skin uh, degrades the upper layer of the skin, and so it's leading to an inflammatory reaction. Um, you want to get a diagnosis with a KOH prep, um, and a bacterial culture can be helpful if there's secondary bacterial infection going on. Now, nystatin powder may be used, which is what we typically go to, but actually an azo antifungal cream is preferred because it supposedly has antibacterial and anti-inflammatory effects with it. So if initial treatment is unresponsive, you can, have, you can treat it with oral fluconazole. And also you want to tell them the usual tips of, um, you know, if they're larger, weight loss for obese patients, wearing absorbent clothing, keeping the area dry as possible, and getting better control for your diabetes if you have it. So hydrodenitis supertiva is also known as acne inversa or Bernal's disease. It's a chronic inflammatory skin addition condition that's involving, again, the intertriginous areas, and that's due to follicular occlusion of the sweat glands. So it's affecting women more than men. It usually begins in adolescents and young adults. And it starts in flame nodules that transform to abscesses and then draining sinus tracts. They're extremely painful. Um, it's often misdiagnosed as recurrent furunculosis or boils. And interestingly enough, smoking and obesity are risk factors. If you have a mild version, you can try chlorhexidine baths and topical clindamycin. And if it's not responding to that, you can try um, long courses of oral tetracyclines. Here, they have three different stages of hydrogenitis. You have the early stage one, which is just the inflammatory nodules at the beginning. Then you have this person having recurrent abscesses, and then sinus tracts. And here, where it's super severe, um, it's happening with recurrent abscesses and interconnected sinus tracts. So 
herpes zoster or shingles, the incidence is increasing after age 50. Um, presenting in a dermatomal distribution is what's helpful for your diagnosis. Now the rash is often preceded by prodromal pain and stinging, and so after that, then it arises this erythematous papules, then the group vesicles, which we know, and then it can turn to the pustular lesions and then crust over. The patient remains contagious until the lesions begin crusting. Now, with the prodromal pain, interestingly, sometimes it can be confused with angina or renal colic or appendicitis, just depending on where it's developing. Now, bed bug infestations occur everywhere in the world, but mainly in disadvantaged areas of people who are traveling frequently. Um, Cimex lactarius and Hemipteris are the two bedbug species that are most commonly affecting us. Bedbugs, they typically are gonna present as this erythematous papules, less than five millimeters in a linear fashion, so you can even see really well here that it's um, coming up linearly. This whole time I thought that was working. <laughs> um, coming up here in a linear fashion, um, but it also may present as um, papular urticaria, um, or preparic macules or bullous lesions as well. Now sometimes the bites can get uh, secondarily infected uh, due to excoriations by the patient and it can cause cellulitis or pedigo. Skin biopsies aren't gonna really tell you anything and most importantly, you actually need to see the bed bugs because it could be some other insect. So you can't, like, there's no use in throwing out all your bedding if you don't actually have bed bugs. So you actually need to see it. Um, and basically you need to get a professional exterminator into your house to look for them because they know best what to look for and then they'll use a combination of insecticides and heat treatment. Um, for the itching, the bites resolve without treatment really, but you can use antihistamines and topical steroid agents. Scabies, this skin rash um, appears as a small erythematous excoriated papules and you may also see the serpiginous burrows uh, as you see here. Um, and that's, you have the classic appearance happening in the webs of fingers, and it also commonly affects your wrists, axilla, and genitalia as well. Transmission is through prolonged direct skin-to-skin -skin contact. So basically you can't walk into someone's house or our exam rooms and just get it. Like you have to be there for a very long time, interacting with the person very closely. Um, so I know we all get scared when we have a patient like that in the clinic and everything, but you're not gonna go home with scabies just because you saw them. Um, the rash that occurs with scabies is due to a type 4 delayed hypersensitivity reaction, which can worsen with subsequent exposures, and itching is extremely severe. What's important also, um, top, the treatment, you want to start with topical permethrin, and we had this issue in the clinic. The person was just putting it on and wiping it off, but you have to like put it on for like eight hours and then wash it off. And that's the proper treatment of it. So cirrhosis is just common dry skin. Um, it can sometimes be itchy as well. And it's more so affecting older adults uh, due to less activity in the sweat glands and the sebaceous glands with age. And it can affect anyone. I mean, our winter's been pretty miserable this year. So, you know, we probably had a little bit of cirrhosis here. And it's happening particularly in the northern winter climates with no humidity. Um, I think, in my opinion, Vaseline is one of the best things to use because it's a uh, has the occlusive nature, it's very moisturizing. Yes, you can use other creams like Lubriderm, but in my opinion, Vaseline is, is the best. And you might want to you apply it after a bath and so really slather it on. Um, of note, I learned that diabetes is also a risk factor for this. <clears throat> so you have your dermatitis. Irritant versus allergic. Irritant is going to be the most common type, and that's just due to the fact that most people would be affected if you put your hands in some caustic irritants. I mean, we all basically have the same type of skin. Um, and the allergic type is depending on the patient's innate sensitivity to that trigger. Um, irritant contact dermatitis can be chemical things like cleaning agents, detergents, or even water. Physical irritants like paper, dust, and soil. And then the allergic contact dermatitis are things like we know, um, poison ivy, nickel, latex, food, and medicines. Here we just have some Examples of the uh, poison ivy, you can see it's happening where the person brushed up against it in a linear fashion. Here down here is a nickel allergy that's been caused, and this is an example of the um, irritant uh, dermatitis. Um, the mainstay of treatment is identifying what's causing it and avoiding that offending agent, and you can use topical corticosteroids um, for you know, itching and things like that. Okay, atopic dermatitis. Um, these are 
usually due to a combination of skin barrier abnormalities and the difficulties in innate and TH2 adaptive immunity. Now, the acute lesions, they start as erythematous and pruritic papules and vesicles <coughs> that's demonstrating ex exudates and crusting. Um, and that's kind of happening over here. Now, the chronic lesions are, are still erythematous papules, but they'll be more so dry and scaly. And then you have the lichenification and fissuring due to the scratching. Now, in adolescents and adults, we know that it's going to be in the flexural regions, um, ankles, neck, inner aspects of wrists, whereas in the babies, it's going to be on the face and the scalp and extensor surfaces. Now, you want to use emollients and antihistamines, which are going to help with your um, symptoms, and topical steroids and calcineurin inhibitors are used to treat the lesions. Seborrheic dermatitis, uh, this has a bimodal uh, distribution. Uh, affecting infants, known as cradle cap with them, and then adolescents through adulthood. Now this condition of erythematous plaques and a greasy scales, as we see here, the scales, um, this is associated with the sebaceous glands and malassezia of fungus. And it's not that malassezia is causing it, it's that it's allowing it to happen, it's permissive. Um, it can be recurrent, it doesn't get better, and it's usually being exacerbated by stress or cold temperatures. <laughs> Um, so that can also even be confused with eczema or xerosis. Um, so your severity is going to have the mild dandruff of the scalp, which some of us might have had, or you can have explosive. Now, when you have explosive um, presentations, there's a strong correlation with HIV, Parkinson's, or use of neuroleptic medications. Um, it can be confused with psoriasis on the scalp, but the difference between that is with psoriasis, the scalps are super thick and more adherent, and they're going to bleed when you remove them, whereas the scales of Cerebrotic dermatitis just flake off easily. Here's an example of the explosive um, presentations in uh, HIV, possibly Parkinson's. So seborrheic keratosis, uh, going along with our seborrheic, um, we there are benign, slow-growing epidermal tumors. Then they usually develop after age 50, but can occur in young adulthood as well. They are characteristically well demarcated and round lesions with a verrucous texture that appear stuck on. Um, genetics may play a role in people that have a lot of them, as you see here. And depending on the amount and how fast they appear, they can be associated with malignancy, along with if it also presents with acanthosis nigricans or skin tags. This is known as Lazare Trelat syndrome. They can often be confused as well with melanoma, so you'd use the ABCD guidelines to help determine the need for biopsy. And here we have an example of that <coughs> severe keratosis, the laser trilat syndrome. Um, here you can see uh, they also have a kind of a Christmas tree distribution along Blasco lines. And Blasco lines are basically dermatomal. It's, they're lines of cell development. And so that can be helpful to let you know what you're looking at. So actinic keratosis also known as solar keratosis. They're one of the actually most common regions that people go to a dermatologist. The lesions are hard and they are more easily felt than seen because of their very rough texture. Now they're usually gonna be found on the sun exposed areas like scalp, neck, face, and arms. And they're gonna present in older individuals obviously because you need the chronic sun exposure over many years. Risks of factors are including your chronic sun exposure and fairer skin. It can be a precursor to squamous cell cancer so um, depending on the amount, you know, you can either get it frozen off or if you have a whole bunch, you can use like uh, photodynamic therapy or topical 5-FU or Miclimod to get rid of them. Now, skin tags, they tend to occur with increasing age, but they may also be seen in the second trimester of pregnancy. Now, we often see them in detrigence areas of obese people and those with diabetes, um, and this is due to insulin resistance and metabolic syndrome. Cutaneous warts, these are typically a manifestation of HPV. Um, diagnosis is made clinically, and the treatment of warts are not, it's not always needed because they can usually resolve on their own within a couple years. Now, if it's bothering you, you don't like the look of it, then you can get it um, chemical destruction with salicylic acid or physical destruction by laser or surgery um, or cryotherapy.
Lipomas, these are actually one of the most common benign soft tissue neoplasms. They're made of mature fat cells that are enclosed in a thin fibrous capsule, and they're usually subcutaneous and mobile, and they really can sometimes be in deeper fascial planes. Now, it's not unusual for a person to have more than one, and in general, we typically only have them removed if they've grown so large that they're encroaching on some nerve and they're causing pain, or, you know, they're just... So if they're on their back and they can't sleep right at night, then you might send them to surgery to get that removed. Cherry angiomas, they're also known as Campbell de Morgan spots, and they typically begin to appear after middle age. So they're also called senile hemangiomas, with 70% occurring after age 70. Now they may be confused with amelanotic melanomas, which these, though, they were, are going to change in size rapidly and they're freeable, and those would need biopsy. Now, you can get these removed by electrocautery or cryotherapy, but you should be warned that these lesions often return often, and there really is no way to prevent them. So, melanocytic levi. We could have a whole other lecture on moles, so I'm just going to keep it simple. Use the ABCD guidelines to help you direct you on your next step, whether it needs biopsy or not. <coughs> okay, so these are all cellulitis, right? Now, red legs do not necessarily mean cellulitis or even venous stasis dermatitis. There are a lot of other pathologies to discover, but we often don't know the difference. And I know that we often get called on this and, oh, we think they have bilateral cellulitis, we got to get them in via antibiotics. We get this a lot. However, cellulitis is an acute condition. It's rarely bilateral. It's usually like unilateral in just one leg. Now, you're going to have this angry red erythema, and you're going to have warmth and tenderness, edema of the affected areas, and it's usually going to have accompanying fever and leukocytosis. Now, it's often initiated with a history of trauma or, or, or pain in the affected area. And also, if it becomes systemic, you're going to have your blood cultures positive. Now, stasis dermatitis is the most common condition that we get it confused with um, because it can be erythematous and warm and edematous, but it typically is not going to have a fever or leukocytosis or lymphadenopathy with it. Now, chronic venous stasis leads to the interstitial edema, extravasation of blood vessels, and decreased tissue oxygenation, which changes the microvascular um, areas, and then it's turning, and that's how we see the erythema and hyperpigmentation. So rather than overt pain, people are going to complain of t tingling or itching in their lower extremities due to the persistent edema that's stretching the skin out. Um, it's usually going to be bilateral, but if it is unilateral, it's going to be most likely the left leg due to the anatomy and the venous return to the heart. Um, with this, you would want to try a mid-potent steroid cream to help with inflammation and compression stockings, which they may be avoiding about because it's painful or stinging, but um, that's the way to go. Now, Lipodermatosclerosis, now this is basically the most severe form of chronic venous insufficiency. It's causing severe damage to the skin over time. And over this time, it becomes so severely indurated that it's becoming tethered to the underlying subcutaneous um, tissue. So acutely, there's going to be severe lower, extre lower extremity pain above the medium alveolus with erythema, edema, and warmth, just as in cellulitis, but there's going to be a sharp, there's no sharp demarcation between the affected and unaffected skin. Now, in the very severe chronic condition, um, we may see this atrophy blanche, and that is due to fibrotic scars that's happening due to the lack of capillaries that have now been overtaken by granulation tissue and the skin is going to seem tethered and bound down with extreme induration. So in short, when venous insufficiency has been chronic for years and the legs are very indurated, they're going to be non-tender, you're going to see a non-tender um, non area and you're going to have a very sharp demarcation to the point that you're going to have it looking like an upside down champagne bottle. See the it's very, very um, abrupt change here. And this is when you know that it's now transformed into the lipodermatosclerosis. Necrobiosis lipotica also um, may be confused with uh, cellulitis. Um, it has an unclear pathogenesis, but it's theorized that the glycogen deposits in the blood <coughs> vessel walls are leading to microangiopathy. Now, it's extremely rare, and it typically is affecting diabetics, 0.3 to 1.2% of them, um, women more than men. And over time, you'll see, you'll start with these 
plaques so that can coalesce and then become these larger sections of the lower extremities, and then they can eventually ulcerate and become extremely painful. Now, initially, it's asymptomatic, but patients may complain of pruritus and dysthesia at areas of skin involvement. Okay, so just want to talk briefly about rashes in that we're going to see in the clinic that I feel like we see the most of, and just thinking about it. If you're, yes, we're at a large academic center, but if you're a PCP in a rural area, these might, you might be seeing these firsthand before you're sending your patients to a specialist. So lupus, which we have a large amount of down here in the south, um, you're going to have three different sections of lupus, either acute, subacute, and chronic cuta um, cutaneous forms. Um, the localized is going to have that classic butterfly rash that we see. Um, and then uh, with the, you're also going to have the, uh, in darker skin types, you're going to have post-inflammatory hyperpigmentation or hypopigmentation of your malar rash, and that may persist even though the inflammatory stage has resolved. Now, in generalized, um, the rash is going to spare the knuckles, and that is a contrast to dermatomyositis, which is not. In generalized, you're going to have um, the erythematous macular papular rash as well, and may also have um, bullae or vesicles. The subacute. Um, it's often drug-induced, and that those drugs that we know are the SHIP, um, the sulfonamide, hydralazine, INH, phenytoin, brocanamide, medicines that we're not really using that much as, or more commonly anymore. So, um, it may, you know, you're not seeing that more this, that often anymore. Um, it's going to begin as slightly erythematous, um, slightly scaly papules, and interestingly, the face is often spared. And here, sometimes it can evolve into these um, psoriaform or even these annular type. Discoid lupus is also known as chronic cutaneous lupus, and the localized discoid lupus it's uh, limited to the just sites above the neck. Then you're going to have the generalized, which is above and below the neck. And then you have this rare variant, the hypertrophic, which is um, hyperkeratotic and verrucous plaques that occur. Now, acute, chronic, subacute, these don't necessarily reflect the duration of the activity of the skin necessarily. It's more so in reference to whether or not these skin lesions are going to leave any residual sequelae. So acute is going to be transient, recurrent, with the rash flaring acutely. Subacute, you can have long-term dispigmentation, but there's not going to be any scars. And then with the chronic form, you're going to have a prolonged course that's going to have scars, like our friend Seal. So acanthosis is nigricans. Um, it's affecting men, women, children equally. But you're going to have more prevalence in Native Americans, Hispanic, and black populations as opposed to, opposed to Asians or Caucasians. Now, acanthosis can also present on mucosal surfaces, but that's more so linked with malignancy. And when the acanthosis rises rapidly and happens on the palms or soles, or all over the body, there's an underlying malignancy. And then you can also, with that, have these tripe palms. And that was, I guess, based on back in the day, uh, if, you would, if you boil tripe, this is what it looks like. Um, so that might be a hint for underlying malignancy, typically GI or lung cancers. And though, although we are associating acanthosis nigricans with diabetes and obesity, it can sometimes just be familial, non-syndromic, or just part of um, genetic disorders like um, Down syndrome or congenital lipodystrophy. Now, psoriasis has multiple forms, um, but we're going to be focusing on the chronic cutaneous, the chronic plaque type. Now, it may be confused with eczema or even seborrheic dermatitis, but it's the locations of the lesions and the accompanying nail changes and arthritis that can help differentiate. Now, scales from psoriasis, they're pretty difficult to remove, unlike the seborrheic dermatitis, which we talked about earlier. It also has the Kobner phenomenon, which is basically, if you were to get an area of trauma in that area, you might develop a psoriatic plaque afterwards in that area. Now, as a side note, they also have a thing called inverse psoriasis, which is happening in the flexural regions, whereas um, psoriasis is happening on the extensor surfaces, as we see here, like the knees, the elbows. You also have guttate form, which typically happens after a URI or erythrodermic, where basically your entire body is covered in the scale. It's pretty scary. Psoriatic nails are also something you will see, and some people might only have the psoriatic nail changes with 
you'll have these oil drop hyperpigmentation or your characteristic nail pinning. So if they have no, if they only have that, I guess they got lucky. Now, dermatomyositis is seen in women more than men with peak incidence to ages between 40 to 50. Now, these cutaneous signs here, the heliotrope eruption, facial erythema, shawl and holster sign, Groton's papules, these are usually coupled with the symmetric proximal weakness of the shoulders and the hips. And then also you can help your diagnosis if you have polyarthritis, dysphagia, ILD, and the usual constitutional signs of the malaise, fatigue, and weight loss. Here we see the Groton sign, the shawl sign, you have your holster sign, and mechanics hands. There are multiple forms of lichen planus that affect the oral cavity, genital, esophageal, um, nails and ears, but we're just focusing on the cutaneous lichen planus. Now it's usually emerging between the ages of 30 to 60, and it has no predilection in persons, but we, will, we do know that it's commonly um, associated with um, hep C infection. Now, although it's usually on the extremities, it can be generalized on the trunk as well. And this also may exhibit that Cobra phenomenon that we spoke about that happens with psoriasis. Skin biopsy is helpful for your diagnosis. And um, without treatment, these lesions can actually go away on their own. Um, common drugs that we use that can help it or, or that actually cause it are thiazides, ACE inhibitors, beta blockers, hydroxychloroquine, NSAIDs, PPIs. These can induce a lichenoid planus planus eruption. And we know from, you know, our med school, the four Ps, the purple, polygonal, papules, pyritic, and you see them here occurring. Sometimes they can co coalesce and make the bigger papules. Important, you'll also have the Wickham Strayer, which is like a lacy type of uh, network that develops on it. Erythema nodosum. Uh, this typically affects mostly women ages 20 to 40 um, years old by far, but it can also affect other populations. Um, classically, it's going to be on the lower legs, but it can also involve the arms and thighs and buttocks and face. Now, when you have the associated arthralgias, hyalur adenopathy with this erythema nodosum, um, this is classic for Lofgren syndrome of sarcoidosis, and you actually don't need any other tests after that. You just, you know, have to start your treatment. But um, sarcoidosis can also have its own subcutaneous nodules, but the difference with that is that in the sarcoidosis nodules, um, they gravitate towards the upper extremities and they're going to be in a linear distribution um, as opposed to the erythema nodosum, which is on the legs, and also the sarcoidosis nodules are non-tender, which whereas erythema nodosum is very tender. Now, it can be triggered by inflammatory bowel disease or be associated with these things, medications, sarcoidosis, but also a large percentage of it is idiopathic. You don't know where it came from. Uh, medications that we are often use that can be causing it um, is oral contraceptives, phenytoin, um, sulfonamides and NSAIDs, um, infections, TB, Yersinia particularly, Hep C, and other things like even lupus, lymphomas, and leprosy. And then finally we have pyoderma gangrenosum. Um, this tends to affect young adults and middle-aged women. Now classically these neutrophilic infiltrates, they're causing a papular pustular eruption that's like quickly turning into um, this purple rimmed ulcer with the rolled borders um, on a purulent base. And this is like it beginning here. And then you see this rolled border, the purulent base. It looks pretty gnarly. And it's actually, you'll, they'll complain of more pain than, than it, you know, it looks pretty bad, but, it, it, but there'll be an ex ex significantly more pain. Um, it's most often associated with underlying inflammatory bowel disease, inflammatory arthritis, and hematological cancers like AML, CML, PCV, myelofibrosis, and as well as being connected to these um, diseases, may also be a part of um, auto-inflammatory syndromes like PAPA and PASH. Um, and that's pyogenic arthritis uh, and acne, or pyogenic gangrenosum with acne and suppurativa hydronitis. You can also get it um, through iatrogenic traumas like abdominal surgery, or with people with stomas, it can also develop um, after that. Now it's important to note that Pyoderma gangrenosum is a diagnosis of exclusion, and it can often be confused with antiphospholipid syndrome lesions, venous stasis ulcers, necrobiosis, lipoidica, and vasculitis, or even just exogenous injury. Okay, so remember, 
it's as important as internal medicine physicians, it's our duty to take care of the whole person inside and out. And I know that, you know, often when we get in the room, we're just like only asking them about what their chief complaint is that day, but it's important to ask patients tactfully about skin defects that you're noticing during these interactions. Like, it might seem rude to be like, what's that on your face? But, I mean, if you say it in a way like, hey, I noticed something there on insert body part here, have you ever had that checked out? Because they might have something on their back that you might pick up on a um, cardio examination or a lung exam or on their feet that they may have never noticed. Um, and this is important because skin pathologies, as we see, may sometimes be the earliest manifestations of serious diseases. So it's important to recognize it so we can get these patients proper treatment sooner rather than later. Then additionally, it's also important to always try to describe these lesions in accurate medical terms because you want to ensure no confusion for subsequent providers. You know, I'm a big um, proponent for this. You know, you gotta think about who's coming behind you and reading that note. So you wanna make sure that you're describing it properly in terms that everyone is, you know, knows about so that it's not confusing. And then this also helps create um, uniformity across the medical record. You guys, questions? Any questions?